your ages two through five. I think you're following Miss Kathy down to Children's Church, right back in the back, ages two through five. Make your way down to Miss Kathy. As they make their way down, we're glad to have again back this week, Brother Chris. He's going to share with us again. I've been on vacation, and so uh, the elders and folks encouraged me to take off a couple of times. They encouraged me back a long time ago, and so I thought, well, I'll do it with me and Turtle Dove. So we had an enjoyable trip, and um, Brother Chris is going to come and preach to you again this morning. So, uh, Brother Chris, you come on, share what God's laid on your heart. I wasn't pointing saying go to your seat. I was, I was, I was saying I need the microphone. I have a little more of a voice this week, but it comes and goes still a little bit. If you want to go ahead and turn to uh, Exodus chapter 20 this morning. We're gonna, you know how my sermons are. I like to look at a chapter at a time. So we're going to look at Exodus chapter 20, and then we're just going to finish out the whole book. The look on faces. We're just going to look at one verse. But the look on faces was just like, really? I got things to do today. I got plans. But you guys were... Pretty excited there for a minute. I don't know if this is on, Terry. Exodus chapter 20. As we're celebrating Father's Day today, we're going to look at just one verse. Verse number 12 says, Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land of that the Lord your God is giving you. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for another day of life that you've blessed us with. We thank you for the opportunity to come together freely and openly to worship you and to praise you and to lift your name up, Father. And I pray that today we keep our eyes focused upon you. Lord, as, as we celebrate this Father's Day, I pray that we look to you as our Heavenly Father and that we express our, our thanks, our gratitude and uh, our obedience to you for, the, for what you've done for us. I pray today that you speak to us through your word and that you are glorified in all that we do. In Christ's name, amen. So this is an easy one, right? We've all heard this commandment since we were very small. I remember as a young child it hanging on the wall in our house. Uh, my parents, my grandparents, they all had that cute little home interior wooden plaque with the golden scroll on it, and uh, I would try to memorize those, and I would try to learn those Roman numerals on that, but we all know this commandment. We know it. We've got it. Honor your father and your mother. Basically, obey mom and, mommy and daddy, and that's true, but that's incomplete. I'm confident that if it only meant obey your father and your mother, that Moses or God could have simply said, Obey your father and your mother. There's more to it, though, than obedience. Today we live in a society where everyone is doing what's right in their own eyes. We are a generation that is marked with disobedience and rebelliousness. And we live in the way that we want to live. We do what we want to do. We do what makes us happy. The news recently in the past six months couldn't make that any more evident. We are attempting to redefine what is right and what is wrong in the world. And the news has, has, has portrayed these people that are doing these things as heroes and, and idols for us to look at and strive to be like. We are trying to redefine our very identity. Men who want to be women can be women. Women who want to identify as a man can be a man. Whites who want to identify as African Americans can do just that, change her race, and, and not just change her race, but lead an African-American organization, because that's what she identifies as. I like what Russell Moore said about it. He said, 
He said, my son identifies as Batman, but I don't let him wear a cape, drive a car, and fight crime. <laughs> but that's, that's the society that we live in. And we're trying to redefine marriage and family. Men can marry men. Women can marry women. Whim, or Men who want to be women can marry women. And we're trying to manipulate it and change that up. Men can marry seven women if they want to. Entire compounds can come together and enter into one large marriage if they want to. And we're making it what we want. Marriage and family has become an endangered species. I watched an interview this week, just flipping through and stumbled upon it, and it was appropriate. They said that right now today in America, there's a larger percentage of unwed adults than ever before. There's Right now in America, 154 million unwed adults. And they had a, uh, a panel of speakers who, who really had no authority or no knowledge on the subject. They were psychologists. They were celebrities, pop culture icons. They had them speak on this. And the consensus was that marriage and family are just not necessary anymore for what we want. If you want to have a relationship, you don't need to be married to have a relationship. If you want to have a sexual relationship, marriage is not necessary for that. If you want to have children, you don't need a spouse. If you want to have a family, you don't need kids. They said family is not needed. Instead, they said it was a burden. One speaker said, I want to have my fun, and I don't need a husband and kids to tie me down. We have this idea that Society and culture are evolutionary. Economy, education, art, athletics, infrastructure, politics, those are all milestones on the evolutionary journey that we're on. And marriage and family is just another of those milestones. They're just another step on the path to completion and enlightenment. But if that's the case, and these things are evolutionary, and marriage and family are evolutionary, that that would imply that eventually we will evolve beyond it and that a marriage and family will cease to exist. But the problem with that is that we can't evolve beyond it and it won't cease to exist. Marriage and family is not a, a milestone on the journey to completion. It's an institution of family, not an accident, but designed by a creator. Marriage the role of father, the role of mother, of children, were all providentially designed by God. And for that reason, we are in a covenantal relationship that reflects God's character. It reflects his image, and it reflects his glory. And the very fact that marriage and family were created by God to display his character and his glory should implore us to take this fifth commandment to honor our father and our mother out into the world. Honor your father and your mother. The people desperately need to hear that. We in the church desperately need to hear that. The Ten Commandments are often broken up into two tables. The first table is the first four commandments. They identify how we relate to God, how we serve God, how we know God. And the second table is made up of the last six commandments. And that's how we relate to one another. And the manner in which we are to behave as Christian people. And it makes clear that God's people are to behave in a way that points people to him. It's important to see also to whom this commandment is given. A dangerous mistake that we make is that we assume that it is addressed to children. Little children obey mommy and daddy. And it's not. There's not nine commandments directed at the adults of Israel and then one commandment directed at the children of Israel. This commandment is directed at the whole nation of Israel. And in Israel, family was much different than the nuclear family that we have today. Family was synonymous with tribe or clan. And a father could actually not just be a father in a, in a family like you know, we're father in a family, but a father could be a tribal leader or an elder. <coughs> Excuse me. The father in that time was the center of the family. He wasn't a dictator who ruled over the family. The, the, the Old Testament very rarely 
speaks of the, the authority and the power of the father, but it does speak of his responsibility. And the father in the, Israel fam, in the Israelite family was like the central hub. Think of it like a bicycle wheel. The father's at the center, and the spokes are the family members, the wife, the children, the grandparents, the children's children, the grandchildren, the great-grandchildren, nieces and nephews, aunts and uncles. And it was basically just a huge extended family. And that was a tribe or a clan or a family. It was not a husband and wife and 2.5 kids. Now these families during this time were leaving bondage in Egypt and they were coming in to Canaan. They were leaving a place where their owner determined who received what, what type of care, what type of provision, and the owner essentially cared for them as slaves. They were leaving that, and they were coming into a promised land where they received their inheritance, and they were responsible for caring for their own. So as they were doing that, they were settling into this rough, undeveloped hill country. It was land that needed to be cleared and worked. It was homes that needed to be built, and it was an area where rainfall was sparse. The struggle was real, and sacrifices had to be made. So the question became up, who's expendable? We can't take care of everyone. We can't feed everyone. Not everyone can work. Who's expendable? And they looked at it as, who's going to live the longest? Who's going to be the most profitable? And the natural answer is, the elderly are expendable. So this commandment was written to ensure that the elderly were not expendable. You need to honor your father and your mother. You need to care for them. As you're coming into this promised land, as you're coming into this new home of yours, as you get settled, honor your father and mother. Not just little children, obey mommy and daddy, but adults, honor your elderly parents. As you come into the promised land, and this day, this land, you will profit And be blessed in it by doing so. So, keeping in mind that family was created by God to reveal his glory and his character. Keeping in mind that all of the law, this commandment and all of the law, calls God's people to a behavior and a character that points to him. This morning I want to look at four quick things. And I know some of the kids are writing notes and trying to trying to keep up with the main points as mom and dad told them to do. So I want to look at four things. The first one is, what does it mean to honor your father and mother? Now there's no checklist in the Bible for practical ways to honor your parents. The way that one parent or one person honors their parents may look quite different than the way another person honors their parents. One person may just need a phone call to call and check on them. One parent may expect their children to come and visit them and have a meal and and clean their house and whatnot. That may be the way that they honor. One dad may say, I just want to sit down and watch a ball game, while another one says, we're going to go out and rebuild the deck. It may look different depending on who it is. It varies. But there are three ways in which all of us, young and old, can honor our parents. It's important to see first that this word honor, it's a Hebrew word that means glory. Glory. Or weighty. It means having a heavy importance or having a heavy significance to regard that person as someone of worth and value. You look at your parents and you see that this person is valuable because they are my parents. They are worthy because they are authority. If we are to honor our parents, and we are to show their importance and value, we do that first by obedience. We obey our parents. We said that this isn't the only meaning of the command, but it's still implied here. To honor your parents is to obey your parents. Obey their teachings. Obey their discipline. Obey their instructions. Honor your parents by obeying them. Now this command comes with a hidden assumption. It is assumed, when this is written to the Israelites, it is assumed that parents, particularly fathers, will teach and discipline their children in a way that merits obedience 
respect, and honor. Parents, we are not to be dictators who rule with an iron fist. We are not to be bullies who provoke our children to anger. We are responsible to ensure that our teaching is biblical and honoring to God the Father. And children are called to be obedient to that. Paul writes in Ephesians 6, 1, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. In Colossians 3, 20, Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Children, obey your parents. It's clear in Scripture. It's not debatable. Obey your parents. Teenagers, college students, that does not necessarily stop when you become adults. <coughs> Excuse me. To an extent, it stops. As you become an adult, as you enter into marriage, you leave your father and your mother and you cling to your spouse and you become independent. You start your own family. And you don't consult your parents in every decision that you make. You may not even adhere to every bit of advice or instruction that they give to you. You could certainly leave the childish things behind and enter into adulthood, but you're still required to be obedient to your parents. You do not have this divine right to enter into stubbornness and rebellion and disobedience. That's not independence. You still honor them. You still listen to their wisdom, and you still follow their direction. Not in all things, but it's still there in some form or fashion. You're an adult, you have your wife, you have your children, you go to their house, they ask you to take out the trash. What do you do? You don't stand up and start throwing a fit and be like, I'm a man, I don't take out the trash, you don't tell me what to do. You take out the trash, because that's your mother and your father, and you honor them by being obedient to them. You're an adult. You may not always obey in all things, but you honor in all things. You show them respect. You show them the weighty value that is due to them. And that may mean that you have to swallow your pride as an adult. Too many times we as adults stand up and say, look at all that I've accomplished in spite of you. And we try to cut that cord and we try to cut that tie. And we're not honoring our parents when we do that. But at the same time, don't romanticize it. Don't be that 40-year-old living in your mom's basement eating mac and cheese because that's where she wants you to be. Don't don't say mom doesn't want me to move out. She needs me to clean the house. She needs me to pay the bills. And all of a sudden, you're in your PJs at 3 in the afternoon with a hot pocket. And then say, I'm just being obedient. You're not honoring her when you're doing that. You're mooching. So... You honor your parents first by being obedient. Not just little children, but even as adults, we're obedient. The second way that we honor, all of us can honor our parents is by showing respect and reverence. Show respect to this person of authority in your life. Show reverence to the position that they have as mother and father. I think young children lack that today. I know young children laugh back today because I have young children in my home. When you speak to an elder, you make eye contact. You use a proper tone of voice. You speak kindly. You exercise patience. Even in your parents' failures, you exercise patience. You give up your seat and you let the elderly sit. You let them eat first. You wait your turn to speak. This one burns me up. Connor does it and sometimes Connor does things that sometimes it's just, it's hard to discipline because it's so cute or so funny. But when he looks at me and he goes, oh, I remember one time we were leaving therapy. I walked out the door first. I was clearly all the way out the door. I was on the sidewalk holding the door open behind the door. As he comes out, he trips and face plants on the sidewalk. And he says, oh, Chris, look what you made me do. (laughs) And I look at it as, Okay, that's a little bit funny, because I didn't touch you, and your little bit of rage is a little bit funny, but I'm not Chris to you. I'm Daddy. He does that to Nana a lot. Oh, Jill! 
And it burns me up because it's trampling upon the authority of that person. I'm not Chris to you. I'm your father. Show me the respect and the reverence that I have with that title. Now, that may seem silly and mundane to do these little things, you know, make eye contact, speak politely. But if you watch your children, you'll see that it's lacking. And if they don't show honor and respect and reverence to you, they're not going to show honor and respect to authority in the society, and they're not going to show honor and respect to God. As children, little children, big children, we are called to love our parents. We are called to esteem and think highly of our parents. And we are called to hearken their counsel. And that doesn't stop no matter the age. No matter your status, you always show reverence and respect. In 1 Samuel 16, David was anointed as king of Israel. As, as God's king, David was anointed. And where was David? He was caring for his father's sheep. In Genesis 48, Joseph was highly exalted over Egypt. And what did he do when his father appeared? He bowed to the ground on his face. In 1 Kings 2... Solomon, wise and wealthy Solomon, showed honor to his mother. No matter your status, no matter your situation, no matter your age, you show respect and reverence to the authority. Now, I struggled when I was writing this because, uh, well, I didn't grow up in a happy home. I didn't grow up with biblical parents. Some of you know that I didn't even really meet my father until I was 22 years old. And I was moved all over the country with whatever man my mother was dating at the time. And it wasn't, it wasn't a, a situation that taught me to be respectful of authority because, well, there was no authority. There was no man. There was nothing. So when I was studying this and as I'm writing this, I start to come up with, well, what if? What if? And this comes loaded with several what if questions. First, what if my parents are unbelievers? Or what if they're asking me to do something sinful? What if I'm a believer? What if I don't even live with them and they're an unbeliever who needs the gospel? What if they ask me to, what if they ask me to sin? First, you honor God. Your disobedience to your parents may be what honors your parents. Because you cannot point your parents to the character of God if you are sinning against him. Your best way of honoring them may be by displaying the gospel to them. So that might be saying, no, I'm sorry, I can't can't do what you're asking me to do. I remember, I've had to do this twice in recent years with my own parents. Once, when I came back from college and I entered into ministry, and they lined up some jobs for me, jobs that I didn't want to do, Jobs that would have put me in a situation where I could not attend Community Baptist. I could not serve at Community Baptist. And this was a time when... Excuse me. This was a time when I was just getting into the ministry. And I was... I think we were planning Memphis and VBS and a few things. And they were saying, well, you need to go to this job interview. You need to do this. You need to quit all of that stuff. And I had to say to them, no, this is what I'm called to do. These jobs are not important to me right now. I I cannot follow your counsel. I have to follow the call that God has placed in front of me. And that resulted in me having to move out of their home. I'm having... And move into a different home. (laughs) I'm having to do that right now with my parents. It's very difficult to have a conversation with them because they look at me and say, when are you going to quit this silliness and get back to work? When are you going to quit school and go back to get a job? And I have to look at them and say, this, this is my job. This is what I'm doing. This is where I'm going with my life. I'm not worried about a factory. I'm not worried about a paycheck. I'm in the business of taking the gospel to lost people. And that, uh, that, doesn't, that doesn't sit easily with them. But I'm honoring them because I'm saying to them, this is what I'm doing. We aren't necessarily... I'm sorry, the, the next question. What if... They don't parent in a biblical way. What if my parents are abusive or neglectful? 
And to that I say, we aren't necessarily called to always honor the individual directly, but we are called to honor the office of parent. In Luke 2, Christ honors Joseph and Mary, but Joseph wasn't Christ's father. But Joseph served in the office of parent and the office of father over Christ, and Christ honored him for it. In his authority, God has providentially placed our parents in our life. They have, he has providentially placed them in authority over us. And we need to show them honor and respect for that authority. And in doing so, we will show honor and respect for God's authority. It won't be easy, but it's commanded. The third way, we honor our parents by obedience, by respect and reverence. And the third way is you show honor for your parents by caring for them in their old age. This command ensures that the elderly Israelites will be cared for by their children. And that's a responsibility that carries throughout Israel and into the church today. If we read 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy 5, if you, don't, you don't have to turn there if you don't want. 1 Timothy 5 says... Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. Younger men as brothers, older men as mothers, younger women as sisters in all purity. Honor widows who are truly widows. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents. For this is pleasing in the sight of God. She who is truly a widow, left all alone, has set her hope on God and continues in supplication and prayers night and day. But she who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives. Command these things as well, so that they may be without reproach. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. (coughs) Excuse me. We are called... We are commanded to provide for our relatives. And if we neglect to do that, we are denied the faith. We live in a world of Social Security and 401K, and for that reason, we never see the necessity in caring for our elderly parents. But Scripture commands it. In France right now, there's even a law that demands that you care for your elderly parents. And if you break that law, you can be fined or go to prison. I think it's wonderful that they have that law in France. But they have that law because a few years ago there was a heat wave in France and more than 15,000 elderly people died. And when they looked for these families of these people, 15,000 people, their families were on vacation. They were working. They were in the cool. They were escaping the heat themselves and casually taking care of themselves. And they let 15,000 loved ones die. That rocked the nation in such a way that they made it a law that you have to care for your elderly people or you go to prison. (coughs) Excuse me. Maybe you're today in that sandwich generation where the kids are moving out at the same time that your parents need care and provision. And I encourage you, don't make excuses because that does not honor them. Don't cut corners and brush them aside because that does not honor them. Move them closer to your home. Move them in your home. Provide medical care for them. Provide provision for them. Take over the finances for them. Whatever whatever is required, whatever they ask of you, whatever care they need, you are responsible biblically for caring for them. And don't make an excuse and say, but I'm busy. I'm busy. The church needs me. The ministry needs me. I got to do this. I got to do that. Don't be the Pharisees who cried out and said, what will you tithe in your name this week? When they were practicing Corbin, (coughs) where they said, the money that I would take and provide for you, I'm going to give it to the church instead, or I'm going to give it to the temple instead. And Christ comes and says, no, you're you're not honoring them. You're, You're stealing from them, and you're neglecting them. Honor your parents by caring for them in old age or be denied the faith. So, what is it? How do we show honor to our parents? Obedience, reverence, 
in caring for them in their old age. The second thing I want us to look at this morning is the seriousness of this command. This is a command that was taken serious by Israel, and it's a command that should be taken serious for us today. If you want to turn to turn over a few pages to Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 21. Deuteronomy 21, 18 starts and says, <clears throat> If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and though they discipline him, will not listen to them, then, it <coughs> then his father and mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of the city at the gate, in the place where he lives, and they shall say to the elders of this city, this is, our, this is our son, is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of the city shall stone him to death with stones, and you shall purge, so you shall purge the evil from your midst, and all Israel shall hear and fear. Wow. To disobey was punishable by death. How about that one, kids? You think spanking is harsh? What about a good stoning? What if your parents didn't say to you, go out and cut your switch? What if they said, go out and pick up a rock? We're going to stone you for your disobedience. Punishable by death. Because it was an act of insurgency against not only parental authority, but God's authority. Do you, do you see the seriousness? To disobey your parents is to disobey God. To rebel against mom and dad, to not clean your room when told, to use an improper tone, to, to, to make an, a, an ugly face towards them is to sin against God. Calvin said, Nature itself ought to teach us the importance of this command. Those who abusively or stubbornly violate parental authority are monsters, not men. Hence the Lord commands that all those disobedient to their parents be put to death. For since they did not recognize those efforts brought to them into the light of day, they are not worthy of its benefits. Paul writes in Romans 1. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, gave, God gave them up to be debased mind, to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They were full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossipers, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, fatherless, heartless, ruthless, they know God's decree that those who practice such things deserve to die. They not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. And in 2 Timothy chapter 3, he says, <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> but understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedience to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people. To be disobedient to your parents, punishable by death, we need to avoid those people. Calvin says you are monsters, not men. For being disobedient to your parents. And we look at it as no big thing. I hear it all the time with Connor. He's just a, he's just a boy. He's just a child. He's going to do things like that. That's no excuse. Disobedient to your parents. He is a monster, <laughs> not a man. He is sinning against me and he is sinning against God and I cannot tolerate it. Also, see the seriousness by, what, by looking at what is at risk. The family is the primary foundation for society. Look throughout history and you will see that where family falls, or where family fails, society falls. 
Civilizations, civilizations crumble due to adultery, homosexuality, and disobedient children. Look at our own nation right now. Look at what's been in the news in the past six months. Look at South Carolina. Look at Ferguson. Look at Baltimore. Where are the, where are the fathers at? They're not present. Prime examples throughout our history as a nation or as a world. Charles Manson, he didn't have a father. Didn't know who his father was. His mother traded him for a pitcher of beer. He didn't have a family. Ted Bundy was born in an unwed mother's hospital. He never knew who his father was. John Wayne Gacy had a father who was abusive and alcoholic. Adolf Hitler had a father who was a bully. And for his entire life, they fought. And they were in contention with one another until his father died. Joseph Stalin's father was an abusive alcoholic who eventually was banished from the town for attacking the police chief, and he grew up without a father. None of those people did great things. Margaret Singer may not be a name that we all know. Margaret Singer had a father who was present in her home but was an atheist. She went on to found Planned Parenthood. If this rebellious and disobedient generation that we're in right now fails to teach their children to honor and respect their parents, this society will fail. It's proven. Do you see the seriousness of the command? Punishable by death. We are monsters. And society will fall due to our disobedience. Thirdly, I want to look at the implications of this command. These are short and simple. Children, do it. Honor your father and your mother. Obey them. Respect them. Revere them. Love them. Listen to them and care for them. If you love Christ, follow his commands. Honor your father and your mother. To disobey mom and dad, to dishonor them, to show them a lack of respect, is to openly and blatantly sin against God. Okay, and if you don't clean your room, you're sinning against God. If you look at me with cruel face, you're sinning against God. If you speak to me in a cruel, unrespectful tone, you're sinning against God. Silly things that we look at as just everyday things are open, blatant attacks on God. Secondly, parents, teach your children to honor you. Teach, disciple, shepherd and discipline them in a way that man, in, a, in a manner that merits and demands and receives obedience and respect. Take every opportunity to teach your children, formally and informally, intentionally, teach them to love and honor and respect and fear a holy God. Teach them the commandments, teach them the word, teach them to obey so that they may live a prosperous and blessed life. I'm afraid that right now, We have children who are going to grow up and they're going to be ignorant and lack of fear of God because we don't teach them. Don't raise up, parents, don't raise up useful citizens or happy children. Raise up children who honor and respect and glorify you because in doing that, they will honor and respect and glorify God. When you teach your children to honor and respect and obey you, You will teach them to honor authority and society, and you will teach them to honor God. And right now, our nation needs this. Riots, rebellion, looting, terrorism, all in the face of of authority. All to stand up against authority. We need a respect for authority in our nation. And authority here is derivative. God is the absolute authority. All other authorities have it by virtue of God giving it to them. But we teach that we need to, that they can recognize God's authority by recognizing our authority. When they respond to me with respect and honor and reverence, they're going to learn to show that same respect and honor and reverence to God as their creator. Israel, <coughs> excuse me, Israel was, was, was promised a prosperous land. They were entering into Canaan, and God says, you're going to go in, you're going to settle, and you're going to prosper there, and you're going to live a blessed life there if you honor your father and your mother. 
Because that's the way to take the command further. They're going to live a blessed life because I'm going to teach them Scripture. I'm going to teach them the Word. I'm going to teach them the commandments so that they can live in obedience, so that they can please God, so that He will bless them. If I don't teach them, if I refrain from teaching them to honor me, then they will fail to honor me, and they will live a cursed life. Teach your children to honor authority. And finally, lastly, how, what does it look like to honor God? Obedience, reverence, caring for your parents. Secondly, the seriousness of the command, punishable by death in a failed society. Thirdly, do it. Honor your, children, honor your parents and teach your children to honor you. And finally, I want to look at how Christ redefines this command. And it's not really redefined. I'm not sure if this was a word. I might have made it up last night. I don't know. I was up at three writing this. But Christ relativizes the idea of family. Is that a word? Is that a word? Relativize? Meaning, Christ is, family is redefined with Christ as the standard. Or it's redefined it's redefined in relation to Christ, if that makes sense. First, it's important to recognize that, that Christ cared for his earthly family. He honored Mary and Joseph. He cared for his mother even when he was dying on the cross. But at the same time that he was caring for his family, the kingdom was front and center in his mind. Matthew 12, people come to him and say, hey, your brother or your mother are outside, they went, they're needing you. And he says, who, who is my brother or my mother except for these? In Luke 14, he says, if you're going to follow me, you need to hate your mother, your father, your brother, sister, your husband, your wife. In Luke 9, a man says, I'll follow you, but let me bury my father. And he says, let the dead bury their dead. Christ cared for his earthly family, but he was focused upon his church. And his church is a family. His church is, is a covenant people. And as a covenant people, we enter into a family even if that calls us to forsake our earthly family. Am I called to obey, respect, and honor my family? Yes, as I am. Commanded by Scripture. Am I called to obey, respect, and honor you as my family? Absolutely. In this home, we have a Heavenly Father. In this home, I have mothers. As I look out, I see... <laughs> Tracy's my mother. Donna's my mother. These are my mothers. I have fathers in here. I have brothers and sisters in here. This is my family. If I'm called, if I'm hurting or if I'm needing, I don't, I don't call my mother. I call you. And I expect you to call me. I may have a blood bond with my family, but I have a covenant bond with you. I may have this relationship with them but I have a relationship with you that was bought with the blood of Christ. And this is a kingdom family that supersedes my earthly family. Maybe you come from a, a home of neglect or abuse or pain and sorrow. Maybe you come from a home with no father or no mother, no brothers, no sisters. Maybe you come from a home with no love. There's no nurture. There's no protection. There's no provision. And to you, I say, welcome home. Come to Christ. Come to the Father. There are no orphans here. There is no dishonored mothers or fathers here. There is no, there's no abuse or neglect here. This is our home. This is our family. He is our father. The church is family. So I leave you by saying, take this command out into the world. Take this to, to society in a generation that desperately needs to hear it. Take it, teach it, and preach it in a way that points them to the father. Honor your father and mother. On the way to church this morning, Caden was, I don't know what we were 
it was on the radio, but Caden said, today's Father's Day. God's our Father. We should get him a gift. Your gift today is to honor your father and your mother. Be obedient to his command to show your gratefulness to your father. And you will be blessed and prosperous for it. Let's pray. Father God, we praise you, Lord, that you are a father to the fatherless. Lord, that you bring in the neglected, the abused. You bring in the, the abandoned. You bring in the... You bring in those who have no one else, Father. And we thank you and we praise you for that. Lord, we praise you that you show us a love that, that we'll never know or never see in this world, Father God. We thank you that you take us in regardless of our sin, regardless of our disobedience, that you bring us in and you, you hold us tightly in your arms as your Father. And today, Father, I just pray that we honor you in respect and obedience and reverence and we lift your holy name up and give you the glory that is due to you. In Christ's name.